Uh, welcome to Artists Now, everybody. Uh, welcome to everyone in my class, all the students in the Tech School of the Arts, and folks coming from every department around the university and the community. So, uh, welcome to the Artists Now series. We have one more uh, visiting artist this semester, so please join us next week, if you will, uh, to see uh, Christian Patterson present. And that concludes a semester of nine guests. Uh, my class obviously has a couple more classes to conclude the semester, but then join us next semester uh, for another full uh, program of Artists Now guests. And those of you who want to learn more, just go to the Peck School of the Arts website, search out Artists Now, and you'll see the full program. Uh, you'll see blurbs about the artists and, and an image. Uh, you, you'll see a printed program around too, but the uh, best place is to go online. So please join us next semester, if you will, uh, for this for this series. Uh, one other thing I should announce, uh, water main pipe broke today, so a lot of the art students know that the um, art school was without um, uh, running water. So anyone needs to, uh, uh, you know, at some point, go to the restroom, should go to Mitchell Hall or the Union and not the art building tonight. Um, there's been a nice buzz about tonight's guest for the last week. There was some really nice uh, subliminal advertising telling us that the Sweet Fleet was coming, and it certainly didn't disappoint. And students were kind of flocking in large numbers. How many people worked on the, the Sweet Fleet? Okay, so this, this is great. Um, so um, a lot of this is thanks to Michael Bernard, who's going to uh, introduce our guest tonight. So he loaded his on my computer and before anyone walked in I scrolled through the whole thing and tonight is going to be really, really good. You're in for a treat. Well, thank you everybody for coming out tonight. I'm, I'm also very excited about tonight. Kyle Johnson's drawings and sculptures tell tales. They are layered narratives that become a springboard for metaphorical investigations of the world he inhabits. They're also just really awesome. <laughs> uh, his sculpture work also serves as, a, uh, as content and concept for a variety of collaborative video projects that foster interactive experiences. And if you haven't been a part of the Sweet Feet, you can stop by tomorrow over in the theater lobby building and experience those those interactive experiences for yourself. Uh, we've been having a really good time building these massive tall ships. Um, Kyle was uh, born in Missouri and kind of grew up in Kansas where he went to undergrad and then he received his MFA at California State University in Long Beach. He's received many prestigious awards and honors including the Pollock Krasner Grant and the Derby Foundation Art Grant. Kyle's work has been published in Push Paper and 500 Paper Objects, both by Lark Books and you can also find write-ups on Kyle's work in every LA periodical from the LA Times to really high-profile magazines like High Fructose. Uh, Kyle currently lives and works in Los Angeles. He's a full-time art hustler, living in a warehouse, living the dream. And uh, please help me in giving a very warm welcome to our speaker tonight, Kyle Johnson. Separate kind of 
deals. And one is my, you know, my gallery work, the work that comes from me, the, the, the fine art that I make, what I'm super passionate about. But um, there, then there's also commercial projects. But my, my, you know, as you'll see, some of my um, personal work has led into really cool commercial projects. And then I also have a side of me that really likes to, well, I haven't pursued teaching. I love to teach. I love to get out there, work with people. I like to treat creativity like, a, like it's a disease. And I want to just talk to as many people as I can. <laughs> Honestly, I just, uh, I love, I get a, it's just, it's the same feeling of making a, a fun drawing as it is for me to work on these ships with you guys. It's just uh, really, uh, really good, you know, really good deal. So I try to do all those three. I'm going to break all that down. But first, I thought that I would give you guys a brief studio tour virtual studio tour. So um, I live in a warehouse, like, like Michael said, in, um, in uh, northeast LA. And um, there is, to the left side, a kind of a, a uh, sculpture, a kind of a sculpture zone where I'm remodeling an Airstream trailer uh, that could be a completely, a completely other talk. I could talk for three hours on that problem. But I, I am uh, basically trying to encapsulate what you see here and make a mobile version of that, that I can just go and, and have a studio pretty much anywhere I want to have a studio. Yeah. Where I'm spending most of my time is to the right, on the other side of that couch, um, in this corner, where I um, am basically just drawing. And I think that everything comes from drawing. Um, uh, everything I've ever made or thought about making started with drawing. And um, uh, I, most, I get deeper into this corner, and this is actually where I spend probably 90% of my time standing on that black square and just kind of pacing around, feeling like I, need to, like I don't have a good idea. And I totally believe that um, good ideas are only going to happen while you're working on bad ideas, um, while you're just noodling around. So what I do most of the time is I am just noodling around. And every day I just start with little sheets of paper, <coughs> And I've got all these drawing boards, and I'm just, you know, really just, uh, just I call it noodling. And I'm just like making scribbles, making dashes, making dots, making connecting lines, trying to make things happen. Um, a lot of times they start out, you know, just simple line drawings like this. Um, uh, they can be based on, you know, I was helping a friend build a deck, so you know, I'm a big believer in, in like I said, ideas just come from kind of dumb ideas. Uh, or things that you might not think are that great. And um, I just just get after it and start noodling around and certain things happen. Sometimes it stays loose and free and it doesn't really add up to much. Other times, the, you know, uh, things start happening based on stuff I've read, based on the conversation I've had, based on a movie I've watched. Um, I can't remember exactly why, but somehow I started drawing satellites one week. Um, sometimes I, you know, I'll read a book like the Jim Henson biography and just want to make a cool drawing, you know, dedicated to two heroes of mine, Frank Oz and Jim Henson. You know, it's that, that, so that seems as valid to me as like a tall ship drawing. You know, um, a lot of times I get deeper and deeper into them and um, really just can't come out of it for days. You know, I just get lost in these drawings. When that happens in a um, super positive way, the room starts looking like that. And I, uh, a lot of those little drawings that you saw, um, you know, there'll be like 10 of them there. One of those is just singing, like, oh, I want to be bigger, you know? <laughs> and, then, and then I will, you know, try to uh, figure out how to make him, you know, bigger. And by bigger, I don't just mean I'm blowing up that drawing. I'm just kind of using that gesture and those s symbols and marks and just kind of trying to make a new version of that guy. Um, other times I'm drawing on wood. I, just want, I put this one in to show you kind of scale. These are also drawings that are just, um, you know, this is me stuck in traffic in LA, wanting to get to my studio to figure out what I should do. Not feeling like I had an idea when I got there. So I just decided to draw how I felt while I was in my car. You know, I just felt like I was in this crazy highway mall city, just stuck, you know. Um, uh, other times I'm inspired by uh, things like bees. Um, I raise bees, or I have some bees, and so this drawing is was the first of a of a series. Like, oh, I'm going to be inspired by the bee. What's it like to be a bee all day, you know? And uh, so I decided I'm just going to do what they do all day, which is just make honeycomb, you know. And I just decided that you know I decided to see what that would feel like, and that seemed uh, you know like the easiest and most obvious solution if you're thinking like I'm going to be inspired by bees. That seems easy, 
But what I wanted to capture was the hive energy, the, the, uh, the buzz, the, the organism that is a group of bees, you know. So I'll, so I'll get a little deeper with it um, and make drawings like this or get really into the flight patterns of the bees and uh, the idea and, and the idea of them just the flight patterns and bouncing from one thing to the next. I'm not really wanting to say flower, but just um, using that idea of the bees to, to, to start a body of work. Uh, seems just as valid to me as the Jim Henson book or a conversation I had with one of you guys. Uh, and then also I'm really into abstracting as I go. So, you know, this seemed the simplest one. This seemed like bee, hive energy, the buzz feeling. But I wanted to abstract it a little more, abstract it a little more, and just, you know, see how far I can take it before it has nothing to do with that. You know, and in that process, learning new forms, learning new uh, textures, new colors, just things happen that will never happen unless you just get started working on stuff. Uh, other times drawings are completely, uh, you know, I guess I'm getting across that I will draw about, I will, I will use any reason possible to make a drawing. Other times it's just, a, you know, I moved to LA from Kansas City, hanging out on rooftops, rooftop parties, going up to friends, you know, that live higher than I've really ever had an apartment, you know, looking out, seeing the city. Um, sometimes that stuff will happen so much that you'll just have to build it, you know. And so I'll just, and I'll come back to this project later, but I thought it was cool to bounce from this to this. Um, uh, so, so I'll start building it, and I like to build things as well. Uh, sometimes the sculptures take on a much more, you know, abstract kind of feel. Um, this is a piece that's kind of about California. Just a, this is a wooden conveyor belt that, that does move around and around. These, these, these clouds just keep, uh, you know, keep trailing around this loop on a constant, like the weather's always the same, there's always a few clouds that roll through and then it just comes back, it's just this, just kind of a perfect day every day. It's really pretty boring, you know? Oh my God, it's beautiful outside. <laughs> and just taking something that simple and just going hardcore with it, you know? And also, I wanted to make an all wooden conveyor belt that worked, and that was, a, for, I don't know why, but that was a challenge to my brain, and I thought, I'm gonna try to do this, you know? So. Uh, so I wrote a grant to build this project, but usually I'm very poor, and so I decided cardboard was the way to go. Um, I was new to LA, I wanted to get attention, I wanted people to know who I was. I had this feeling that building big would be the way to go. And I mean, it's not true that bigger is better, but that's the way it was for me like about 12 years ago. So I was just trying to build big crazy things out of paper that didn't cost a lot. I was really into observation, uh, sneaky things, uh, things that could just creep up and, and observe. I thought, I've always thought it's cool, whether it's a blimp or a submarine or um, like that crazy floating camera that I was, or that uh, air traffic control center up there. Uh, but they, the idea was just to build big and get attention. I think that's important. Um, you got to learn how to market yourself. Um, nobody's going to just pluck you out of nowhere and say, hey man, we want you to make a living as an artist. We just want that to happen for you. You know, that is not ever going to happen. You have got to learn how to brag about yourself without being a braggart. You know, you have to learn to talk about yourself. What's going on, man? Oh, nothing. You know, what's going on, man? Oh, I got this project and this project. And you want to, you know, you just have to learn to be excited and be enthusiastic about what you're doing. And um, that all started, I think, by my, my, you know, just trying to get attention with big pieces and also with cheap stuff. I started uh, this idea that I would use cheap materials to make beautiful objects. It's not a brilliant or a, a unique idea. It's just something that I was into at the time. Um, this is a control panel made with all pizza boxes and shoe boxes and stuff that I found <coughs> from the dumpster, really. I mean, I was just pulling out trash and then building this thing and covering it with so much paint that it became beautiful again or it became not trash. You know? um, I was also doing things like uh, I would have a show and it would be at a gallery and the gallery had their sign up and I would convince them that I needed to put my sign up and then I was just trying to like wherever I had a show, this is in Chinatown, I would try to mimic the, the signs around me, you know. And this is a, this is a, so I did, I did Alex Jones, or Jones exactly like, you know, here is, and I think that this is a pretty cool piece in itself with or without the show that's inside, you know. And the funny thing is that I, I really think nobody noticed that. <laughs> I really don't know. 
that, like for a month, I was just waiting for someone to say, dude, I saw that sign, that is so brilliant. And I think people just walk right by, you know. But I have this picture to prove it that I took over Chinatown once. Um, so, but the, the point I want to get across to you guys with that stuff is just marketing, and I was just learning about how to get myself out there. Like I said, no one's going to do it for you. Um, where are we at? Oh yeah, okay. So then I stumbled upon uh, video. And every, you guys probably know way more about video than me now, but at the time, this was probably eight years ago, I'm guessing now or something, I got asked to build something that I did not want to build, which is something that uh, I would suggest you guys always say yes to those kind of projects, especially when you're young. Um, there was a, a, this, a girl, a friend of mine, that was having a photography show. She was asking me to build a camera to hang in the storefront window to get people excited to come and see her photographs. And I was just like, I'm not interested, Grace. I was, I'm working on drawing, you know? She kept asking me, Grace, I don't want to do it. But she's really cute, and I like her boyfriend. He's a good friend of mine, so, and he's a really great videographer. And um, she just kept coming at me, and I like persistence. I try to be persistent, too. <laughs> and if somebody's going to be persistent with me, I try to value that. Like, I would hope that they would be if I was persistent with them. So she kept getting after me, but I came up with this plan. I said, you know, I will build this thing for you that I don't want to build, but I want to show people how much fun it is to make stuff. You know, I'm not so concerned, and this goes true with any artwork I make today. Like, it's really great to be in a gallery on the white walls and all that, but, and have people even buy it is, you know, very cool. But the, the, the actual making of that thing, the, the, the sitting in there by, you guys know that's, that's where it's at, you know, the actually doing it, like making these ships, once these ships are done, wow, we got some ships, but we've been having a great time making, you know, and that's what it's like, that's what it is for me. I wanted to share that, so I said, Grace, I'll build your camera, but your boyfriend's got to come over, and we've got to do something cool to show everybody how fun it is to build this camera that I don't want to make, you know? <laughs> So with that, I'm going to show maybe five or six videos throughout this presentation. Here's the first one. Uh, this is really the first video I've made. Let's see what else can I say about it before I hit play. Um, I, uh, I didn't realize at the time that I was making, I thought I was just pulling one over on Grace and getting a cool project, but really I was making a commercial for myself. And this isn't a water skiing squirrel video, but it, it got like a couple hundred thousand hits like that. And I was just like, oh my God, what? You know, all of a sudden, what I do, I can show everybody. It just, it just clicked with me. So here we go. Twin, oh wait, is that it? Here we go. Is that loud enough? Yeah. 
chalk Riding on a concrete walk A king died in the night Drinking from a Judas cup Looking down and seeing up Sweet red wine Uh, 
Um, okay, so that's one. Another thing I'm going to do with this work is just try to show you some, some you know, your art career is never just like, it's a tree. You know, you can go off on this tangent, go on this tangent. The other thing is this isn't in really chronological order. It's just, uh, I mean, that, that tangent was, but this piece popped up somewhere in there. Uh, I got excited. I was doing a lot of drawings about um, printing presses. My dad owned a small newspaper growing up. I grew up around them. I really liked outdated technologies. Um, you know, 10 years ago, or whenever this was made, like seven or eight years ago, it felt like, uh, you know, uh, I mean, it happened <coughs> earlier than this, but the computer had fully taken over. I was, I was getting my National Geographic online. I was getting, the, you know, I was starting to myself get rid of print media. And I just wanted to make like a swan song to print, excuse me, a swan song to print media, or a kind of an homage to my father, too. Um, but I made this press and it had no drawing in it. I knew the whole time I was making it, I was like, you know, what am I going to put in this thing? I can make or break this piece. What is going to go in here? What is this printing press printing? Um, and like, like I've been explaining, I just decided to, uh, to put it down and start drawing. I felt like I had no good ideas. And what am I going to draw? What am I going to draw? Well, I could try to draw everything I own in the entire world. <laughs> <laughs> what would that? What would that look like? You know. So I literally like that is everything I own. Honestly, there's nothing. Like I don't own anything else besides what's up there. And there was no attention paid to scale. My truck is like right there. You know, right next to the keys. Uh, the, there's, there's just. I was just. I literally got a. Uh, you saw in the early slides. You saw a drawing board in that corner. That's on wheels. And I just like just went around opening drawers, dumped it on the table, and just cataloging stuff. If I counted. Like, uh, it's not the best slide, but uh, like this plug adapter or whatever this is, it's hard to see up close, but whatever this is, it has three of them, so it's times three. Or I have four of these water hoses, times four. <laughs> yeah, just like, uh, great for the insurance company. <laughs> and, uh, and just a fun exercise. But then it turned out, uh, and I never, I never thought I would put that in the press. But it turned out that that was the perfect thing. You know, everybody's got an Instagram, a Facebook, a Snapchat, a Twitter, or whatever. They're just like, my life, look at my life, look at my life, look at me, and check it out. Everything, share, share. So I figured, I'll just make this machine that's just constantly printing everything I own. <laughs> and uh, obviously, it didn't really work, but I printed it so that it was like barely legible in the back. And each, each image got darker and darker. The original's on the wall over there. And then that is a blow up uh, wall drawing of the drawings I was doing at the time that inspired this, you know. Um, and it was another thing where I drew a pretty basic one and then abstracted it, abstracted it, abstracted it, abstracted it. That's kind of one of the goofier ones. And then build that. Um, oh yeah. So one thing I was getting uh, crap for, or getting you know, getting razzed about by people, they're like, where are your clothes, dude, where are your clothes? And I kept saying, well, they're in that armoire over on the left, but that wasn't good enough for people. So I drew all the clothes that I had. <laughs> and, uh, you know, you learn a lot of cool stuff about yourself when you draw your clothes. Um, or maybe not a lot of cool stuff, but you learn some things. Like, I would probably have told you before this drawing that I don't wear red. I'm not against red, for those of you that have it on, but I just don't, I don't know, I don't wear red shirts, really. But I have so many, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was really strange. I bought them. I just don't ever wear them. Uh, but then, so this, this, you know, I also think about the viewer. The viewer doesn't know me. It's just looking at boys' clothes. So my girlfriend at the time, she has clothes too. So I drew all her clothes. Um, that was a little harder to get all those clothes away from her. But I let her have like a week's worth of stuff. And then I took all her clothes to the shop. Or actually, I drew. I, I, what did I do? I think I, I think I took what she was. I let her choose what she was gonna wear for a week, and then I took all that stuff, drew it, gave it back to her, then took all her clothes. Because uh, you know, the drawing is one thing, but then there's the coloring or the painting, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, that this this exercise started a whole other tangent in my art career called everything drawings, and uh, I just got into it, and I have drawn. I mean, I've done every, I've done pages of, uh, I'm not going to bore you guys with everything growing, but I've done the suns, I've done those cameras, uh, I did yo every yoga pose I could find, I did, um, I've done uh, all the equestrian paintings I could find, all the, all the bird paintings I could find that I liked, uh, but what it ended up leading to was this,
this idea of, of crowdsourcing. I Facebook or Instagram stuff all the time. One a day, I try to just like, it's all about our career. I try to keep people in the loop, try to keep people excited about what I'm doing. But with this drawing, it marked a complete change in the everything drawings, and that's crowdsourced. I could have Googled chair and just drawn chairs, but I sent out a Facebook message that said, hey everybody, send me a picture of your favorite chair. So they, this is basically a portrait of my friends, you know, I mean, or my family. I mean, some of these chairs were in my house growing up that my mom sent. But, you know, when I look at that drawing, you guys just see chairs. I see, like, friends of mine, you know, I see Nicole's chair and Steve's chair. And, um, I just think there's something really interesting about that. The artist is more connected to it. You're going to draw a little differently knowing that that's your ex-girlfriend's chair. Or, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so since then, I've done, I've done things like, uh, I don't have it to show you, but I'm working on one now that's called like Memorial Day Weekend. And I basically uh, messaged everybody and I said, send me a, a landscape shot of where you are right now. And so one three-day weekend, uh, and you know, you have people that are following you all over the world. So I got pictures. One week, I had hundreds of pictures coming in of landscapes, which is where everyone was. And it seems kind of weird, but it's turning out to be a really beautiful drawing of just landscape, 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 landscape. But anyway, crowdsource stuff. Um, so thinking about all, so, so go back a second to these, where I'm thinking about possessions, possessions, all the crap I have. I thought, you know, what am I going to do when the dirty bomb goes off? What am I going to do when the earthquake hits and California falls into the water? What are you going to do when you can only grab one thing and you got to get out, you know? So this is my survival vest. Um, <laughs> this is my, yeah, my prototype concept for like the, everyone should have this in their closet. And whenever the shit goes down for you, you just strap this on, you've got communications, you've got first aid, some snack bars, you know, whatever. Um, but it also was a place where you saw me working in cardboard, in big cardboard, I was making things like those ships. I discovered chipboard. Chipboard, you guys, a lot of you know what it is. I know that it's being used in the prototyping classes and stuff. It's like the back of a spiral notebook for, for people that don't know. And it's cardboard, it just doesn't have corrugation. I was able to get so much more detail. And that just threw me into a whole other loop. And those headphones got me excited about music. And I was like, I gotta build a boombox, you know? <laughs> and so I built this big boombox because of, you know, back in the 80s, you know, now you want the smallest boombox you could possibly strap to your arm and go jogging with. You used to want the biggest boombox you could possibly have put on your shoulder and walk around with. And then I thought, if this boombox is that badass, it's gonna be double sided. So it's hard to see from that photo, but it's double sided. Then I built some tapes, you know, because you only listen to tapes in a boombox. And then I thought, somebody with that boombox doesn't have six tapes. He's got a hundred tapes. You know? <laughs> so I just built it with tapes. So it's just this organic flow. Um, the music thing got me interested in real music. And I found myself with a silver tube in my mouth one day, just like goofing around in my studio. And I thought, wait a second, I can actually make a flute. You know? So I made this pink piccolo, that I call it, this little piccolo. Uh, that was just a crazy, crazy experience to make that because while you're making that, I thought about a million other instruments I wanted to make and just started making them. Uh, I got the fiddle, banjo, and I decided I would make about four more fiddles or violins. Because when you're making stuff, we talked about this today with some kids, but you know, if you're going to make a can for the ship, and you're going to cut this piece, and you're going to cut this strip, and you're going to make this wheel. You might as well make, it's so easy to just make three of them. You know, if you're going to make one, you might as well make three. So I had this violin. It wasn't put together yet. And I just thought, man, before I start sticking all this together, I'm just going to trace all these pieces out, you know, and bust out four more. And then I thought, you know, you know, who has all these instruments but like a one-man band, you know? And so I built this one-man band for all that stuff. And um, also, I really like Dick Van Dyke's character in Mary Poppins. That dude that he like has this crappy job doing chimneys, but he does chalk drawings, jumps in them, he's got the one man band. As a kid, I was just like, that dude, that is a cool guy. <laughs> so I always like one man bands. I also feel like as artists, we are one man bands, especially in the beginning. You're the website guy, you're, 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 you're fixing your shop, you're the, you know, the shop tech, you're the concept guy, you're building frames, you know, you guys know, you're a one man band. And then it just blew up, and I just decided, what would that one man band be carrying? You know? So he could carry a trumpet, he could carry an accordion, he could carry a, you know, I just, I just freaked out on, on, uh, on cardboard and on music. 
And this kind of, uh, in a way, concludes my private work. I'm going to bounce over now. But, uh, um, um, but well, let's see what I'm trying to say. Oh, yeah, but by this point, I was a cardboard boy. I mean, people knew me as a cardboard guy. I was getting invited to be in all these shows that were cardboard shows. Oh, man, car the card. We want to interview you for paper, paper, paper. And that's great. It's so fun to get that attention. But I started feeling like pigeonholed into just cardboard guy, you know? And it started actually being annoying. And I did it to myself <laughs> because I made some pretty cool things with paper. But uh, I've since kind of tried to push away from it. But the good thing that happened is not only was I getting called to be in paper shows and interviewed to be talked to about paperwork, but the, um, the kind of commercial world started calling. And uh, that's now transitioned into some projects that I've done uh, for money. But one of them, this one, I guess, was free. So I should say, um, you know, people started, companies started calling me. They weren't necessarily asking, give me money yet, but they were like, do we like what you do? You want to do some stuff? There's a company named Roger, like Loud and Clear, 10-4, Roger, uh, some friends of mine, post-production company. They do a lot of cool stuff for a lot of cool companies. But they also have a film festival. They asked me, uh, I haven't switched to the slide because it'll automatically play. But uh, they asked me if I would do an intro for their film festival, similar to the way you did that twin lens. We really like that twin lens. You know, the whole time that's been floating around the internet. All right, well, what's your film festival called? They said, well, it's called the Short Stack Film Festival, like Short Stack of Pancakes. OK, here we go. <laughs> Nationwide, I think, nationwide, or, uh, I don't know, some insurance company. Uh, 
nationwide as long as, yeah, nationwide. So, <laughs> organ and Stevie Wonder was going to play this thing. 
And, and he didn't. He didn't. But Stevie was gonna play this thing the whole time I was building it. I was like, dude, Stevie Wonder's gonna play it. And, and I'm just so so excited building it, going crazy. Uh, got an or got two organs, electric organs from a thrift store, a bunch of pipes and stuff from Home Depot. Went to the Budweiser and picked up some kegs uh, to build a drum kit. That, they didn't, they didn't like it, so it ended up just getting turned into like power for the organ. And then the idea was that Stevie Wonder was going to be playing Superstition to the beer. And like infusing the beer with Stevie Wonder's mojo. But nobody asked Stevie if he wanted to do it. And so the whole, and they were just like, well, we already licensed this song. I'm sure he'll do it. Turns out I had nothing to do with any of this. I never even met the guy, but he didn't want to do it. He didn't want to literally play music to beer. So I, I, I have to take some credit. I saved this. I really feel like I saved this project in the end. I, over a telephone meeting, said, what if it's a player piano? You know, what if we just make the keys go down themselves? It's just this mysterious, mystical organ that's playing, playing beer, you know? And with the art director, I thought about it for a little bit. And I was just like, we're too far into this. The organ looks good. And I'm like, let's do it. It's a player piano. So I was able to, like, make an incision underneath, hook these eye hooks up, and run these fishing lines back. And so I'm behind this organ, you'll see the commercial in a second, pulling these keys down and pulling little flaps on top of the, on top of the, uh, on top of the, uh, <laughs> on top of the, uh, the pipes, like uh, vents for a big, big semi-exhaust, you know? So keep an eye out for that. Um, so some of the slides that I think are there aren't necessarily there. But uh, 
we'd get them inside with instruments, making crazy sounds. We drop a microphone through the top, record this album. Then I've got a friend that remixes that into something that actually sounds cool. And then they get to go home with a CD to bug their parents with that they made with crazy instruments. They get to record their favorite silly sound. You know, every kid's got a silly sound. Then we work that into a, I say we, I don't know anything. They work it in, my buddies work it into a, a, a little soundtrack for the day, you know. Um, but I guess what I'm saying, oh yeah, but this slide, that volcano at the Getty, I didn't want to do it, I didn't have time to do it, I did it. I did it, I got to meet a bunch of people at the Getty, I got to charm all these people at the Getty, and then all of a sudden they were like, uh, let's have that guy who did that volcano come back. And so you get bigger projects. I built the Getty, this is the Getty Center, I built the Getty at the Getty, and then, and then I invited the public to come up for a weekend. Oh, I even built the Cactus Garden. For those of you that have been to the Getty, that's like the best part of that place. I mean, there's some really beautiful artwork in there too. The Cactus Garden is, is seriously like a legit spot to go hang out. Um, and then I invited the public to come remodel the Getty. And so for the whole weekend, we just remodeled the Getty. The idea was like the most beautiful building in LA, still has room for improvement. You're invited to come remodel the Getty this weekend, you know? So people just, we just, I mean, I, have, I could do a whole talk on this project. It just, it got so insane, but that's a pretty good one that shows it. Um, I've done other projects where uh, the Sovereign Nation of You, I did a, at a big TED conference in Palm Springs, um, TED Active it's called, where, uh, uh, what would your flag look like if you were a country? And everybody made flags. I, uh, I'm a big believer in getting people to cross that, that step of I'm not creative to like, look what I made, you know? And so to do that, I try to, to form these projects that offer assistance. I cut out over 150 templates that were my drawings of stuff that could be on flags. So people could just get some felt, grab some of my templates, trace them out, you know, build their flag with my drawings. Or what I promoted more was just make your own flag, forget about my templates. But I still provided that stuff for them to, uh, to do it. And we hung them like Buddhist prayer flags or whatever, you know, all across this park. And just made a beautiful piece of art or a scene, you know, with everyone's flags. I'm a big believer in this like salad approach where you can just kind of grab, it's trash right now, but you can just kind of grab a little bit of that. The templates were on that table. Piles of felt on this table, gluing station over here, and then a uh, moon in the middle as a photo booth for your flag. So you can stick your flag in the moon, take a picture, and then go hang it up. Because um, uh, you know people love photo booths, and Ted loves tweets and stuff like that. Um, uh, so with that, I have two of those style of projects that just went completely like just off the charts, uh, off the charts. And they all started, they both started in very simple ways like we usually do. Uh, this was literally a Halloween costume that I made just to like go goof around at this dude's house. And, uh, and um, at the same time, I was having friends of mine like, uh, like Michael uh, that were teaching at a school called Cypress uh, college. They were inviting me to come talk to my students, come do a workshop with my students. I was busy. I don't, know, I don't want to do that right now. I don't know what I would do. Um, I was going against my own rule of saying yes, you know, and I was just, oh man, I don't know if I want to go do that right now. But I was building this costume. So I realized that I had actually templates for a robot suit. And if I were to show up with those templates and a bunch of cardboard, I could get every college kid there to trace these templates out in one day and we would have a freaking army of robots in no time, you know? So I pitched that idea, we got super excited about it, and, uh, and we just went for it. Um, I think the next shot is a video, of kind of a behind the scenes of that workshop. All of you that were with me the last two days, don't even need to watch, because we had the same type of fun, but here's what it looks like captured on, on film. You have to hear me mumble first a little bit. Now they discover what they can do individually. You just see their suits kind of take these uh, forks in the road. They're working with the with this paper, and you kind of see it kind of awkwardly being clanked around. And it took about an hour for people to realize what they can do with cardboard. You just see that energy flip.
you, the, the, for people that are with me last two days, you don't need to see that because you know how much fun it can be, but doesn't that look like a fun project? Um, and you see there that it was more, and I'm going to show you in a second, but it, it was way more than just making 45 robot suits with some kids. We realized that they weren't, and we wanted, I wanted this to happen. It was like trace my stuff and then customize for two days, you know, or for three days. So once we realized what we had, I realized that I have these friends at Roger that do cool videos and they work for Nickelodeon and Burger King and all the, you know, these companies that, they're doing whatever, they did that, like you guys, um, the Simpsons did like a big marathon lately, there's all these weird words turned into characters and stuff, that's my buddies that made those. I figured they're way too busy to give a uh, care about me and my robot staff or whatever. So I, but I called them anyway, I said, hey man, I got a bunch of actors we don't have to pay, I got um, a university that will give us free reign of any building we want. You guys should come down and help me make a robot movie, you know? Uh, what do you think? Yeah, we'll be right there. That sounds great. They were just so excited once I showed them what the kids had done. So they got uh, one of their cinematographers. They got a full, like, uh, I think it's called a half ton truck, a half ton rig, which is like the smallest rig you would get if you were shooting a commercial full of lighting equipment. And Oh yeah, so there's this, so there, oh yeah, I forgot to put these slides in too. So there's kind of what these beautiful suits look like. These, uh, and I told everybody, you're going to get a part based on, once the, once we uh, started seeing how cool the suits were, I realized, like, we're going to do something special. So I started saying, like, as incentive, like, if you want a good part in this thing, make a good suit, you know? So here are four main characters, because they just killed it. But you can see, like, normal lighting, blah, 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 looks just like some crazy cardboard suits. Got some lighting in there. Oh, wait. Another new slide. So then we sat. So then we, we sat down with everybody. We brainstormed. We came up with an idea, and we decided it was going to be this prom. It was going to be a boy picks up girl at the parents' house, goes to prom, chaos ensues. That was basically what we came up with. Made some storyboards, got a lighting rig, and I mean, all of a sudden, it just started looking super, super professional. You know, that's just all the change from there. From there is light. You know, it's just totally insane. <laughs> So with that, the robot problem. This is the law, this is like five minutes. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
front of me. And I was just like buying lunch. You know, I wasn't just like, come over, I mean, I guess, if you want. And uh, anyway, I know I'm running out of time. Uh, I decided to do this public project, make a salad bar. People can kind of come through, grab a little bit of this, grab a little bit of this, grab a hot glue gun, grab a knife, go sit down, let's make a city. I call it Everyone's an Architect. And I showed up at the TED Active Conference and invited, <laughs> Theo, invited Theo to come shoot it, of course. And here is the <laughs> Sum up what I am all about. 
and they made this beautiful church out of the lost house key of one of our uh, helpers. She was locked out of her apartment for two days. She could not. She could not find her only house. I think she broke in. I, uh, the story is changing now. I tell it that she was locked out for a couple days, but she was just like couldn't find the key for a couple days. She got into her place. But these kids just—they took what they had. They used their imagination and they made a church. And that's what it is all about for me. Just take what you have and make something beautiful and don't give a shit about anyone else. You know. And that's what these guys did. And um, anyway, with that, I'll end it. So show up tomorrow. And let's make some boats. Thank you guys.
I take a lot of photographs because you, like most stuff looks better in photographs than it really looks. You know, uh, like those robot suits are awesome, but they were you know they're all completely ragged by the end of that day. You know, um, selling point selling points like if I'm trying to bring other people into a project that I've started and it gets out of hand. Yeah, yeah, uh, just good images. Um, just trying to be enthusiastic. Um, Show them other projects I've done. You know, the first one's hard, the second one's hard, the third one's a little easier, the fourth one's a little easier. Once you have like a, once I can send them the, all the stuff you guys just saw, then they, you know, it just starts with one, man. And then you, you, you build your confidence and you have more stuff to brag about and you have more proof like, dude, I can actually make this happen. I've done it before, you know. Um, so the first, it just gets easier and easier in a way to do that. Right behind him. What was the name of your Halloween costume? KJ6000. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm still called that by like 10 people out there. Every time you see me, like, KJ6000, what's up? <laughs> um, what was the name of the artwork with the, the roads in a circle? Uh, I'm going to be a little late. Of her, and I sent those pictures of her, 